The Renaissance had such a significant impact on the future of art, and indeed recent history, that I am going to take a little time to explain the relationship this rebirth had with previous empires of the Greeks and the Romans, and its ancient and lasting philosophy that came to underpin most of the Western world's thinking right up to present day. The idea that a visual mark was ever going to be truly representative of an original image is probably something that has been questioned since man first made that mark. The cavemen at Lascaux, for example, their images have been pored over by historians and archaeologists of recent years. On our terms, they were certainly not a true representation of an animal, but a certainly recognisable interpretation. In present day terms, this would be seen as a symbol or a sign. Think of a sign of a tree, an outline, we recognise as a tree, but it would not be a true representation of a specific tree. And for that matter, how do we know that the cavemen wanted these basic outlines to be less real for a reason? Or even that this was indeed as good as it got in terms of cave painting? That is where historians and archaeologists have been able to piece together an overall picture of life at any given time. In other words, putting image making into a wider and also specific cultural context. The Egyptians and their image making, for example, a language in itself of hieroglyphs, figurative representations as was intended by their culture to convey a message. Whether or not the reliefs carved were without perspective or had a linear motif rather than depth, without the context of Egyptian life and thinking, historically, we could only project our own comparisons onto this. And this is where historians and art historians have played a crucial role in our understanding of why images were depicted the way they were, decoding the meaning within a specific culture, not just our present day interpretations of them. During the Renaissance, there was a great deal of retrospection towards the humanities as studied by the Greeks and the Romans. More crucially, the architects of the Renaissance, and there were quite a few important players, paid particular attention to these details. A classical thinking which had fallen out of focus as the Greek Empire had faded, but during desperate times, this way of seeing proved to revive the machinations and aspirations of Renaissance thinkers. And so a new empire of classical thinking was born. Precisely how we understand, question and interpret life and ourselves became crucial to the philosophy that underpinned the Greek empire during its prime. This questioning was initiated by Socrates up until then, benign worship of the gods for human solace, comfort, atonement and attainment was the method of choice. This altered when Socrates started the ball rolling with a new and more scientific approach to understanding why things happened, suggesting that an unexamined life is not worth living. This came to be scrutinised further by subsequent pupils of Socrates during late antiquity and further benefit during the Renaissance years, not least in the written interpretations of what was happening. To truly understand what happened during the Renaissance and how this thinking became a firm basis of historical discourse, indeed right up until the mid 20th century, this questioning approach needs to be rediscovered a little. A few fundamentals offered by the thinking of Socrates, Plato 
and Aristotle. I mentioned the need to make a mark, a human response to our surroundings and also experience. Visually, this is interpreted by the human eye and brain more immediately than through vociferous or written language. Now, what Plato, Aristotle and later Descartes pondered upon was how an individual would read the actual thing and any subsequent mark or representation. Put another way, if we are presented with a smell or sound of something, we conjure up a memory from that previous visual sensation. When we look at the actual object, our mind is closest. Plato argued that for a human to see an object, it was not only the mechanics of the eye, but the mind bringing to that visual experience numerous additions. Put in allegorical terms, if we place a bucket on the floor, a baby will see the shape and the colour, not knowing how to describe either, but will have a visual perception of shape and size, but possibly not function. An adult, however, who has prior experience of this bucket will immediately draw similar conclusions, but with the addition of a prior known function. And this is the interesting part. The baby without that prior knowledge would probably use their limited experience and imagination and draw a different conclusion by possibly placing it on its head. Aristotle saw the human mind as having a higher level of cognition, a common sense in which all previous experiences were drawn in to reach a conclusion about a visual experience. Plato and Aristotle both believed in this fundamental reasoning. The idea that imagination was born out of the soul. Plato believing that the soul was based in orphism, that the soul was reincarnated and so brought sacred experience with it to bear into the future. A purity of memory, if you like. The science behind our perception of objects was also based on the idea that the eye was not alone in the process, that we may anticipate the smell or sound of something from simply looking at it, that we remember a memory as not our initial sensation, but an overall image of that. And from that, we can add extra, possibly absent things to that overall image, or to imagine or dream. And so, the significance of that mark made by a painter, making it more than just a daub of paint, is part of this decoding process. The basis of Platonics was the belief that a copy of an image had to be a true likeness, not an approximation, it had to come purely from the soul. The trouble Plato had with artists rendering images as wholly true, he banished artists from his Republic dialogue, was because the idea or imagining that happened within the soul of the artists was going to represent an image tainted by the artist's experience and therefore not a true image.